Good Wednesday morning. Again, let's go back. We'll go to Isaiah. Now, this is Isaiah 25, okay? This, I got a, this is a great line, okay? You have to picture this. He said, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines. Juicy, rich food and pure choice wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven all, over all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will remove from the earth, the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God, to whom we look to save us. This is the Lord for whom we look. Let us rejoice and be glad, for he has saved us. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. That is a profound, profound and radical hope that the final separation, which is the separation of death, will be overcome. See that? On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all people. The web that is woven all over all nations, he will destroy death forever. See? Boy, is it... When you're, I told my students that the other day in class. When you're young, death is remote. Hopefully, you have not tasted it when you're a kid and a young person. As you get older, it's not only that you have tasted the death of those whom you have loved and been loved by, your family, your friends, your grandparents, your partners in life, your uh, spouses, but you begin to feel your own diminishment in life. You feel your own death. You feel your own death coming. I, I talk about it with my kids in class with <laughs> real readiness. I, there, a lot of them are pre-med kids, and I got to admit, I, I flirt with the pre-med girls and I make fun of the pre-med boys, okay? With the pre-med girls, I said, I want you to look at you. I want to look at a pretty, pretty face when I'm dying. You're my doctor. I want to see these ugly fellas. <laughs> and I tease, you know, I get to laughing at myself. But I said to him the other day, I was teasing about this stuff. I don't want that guy cutting on me. He's too ugly. I want you to do the surgery. You know, pretty young woman. You know, just being a jerk, okay? But what wasn't being a jerk, I said, yeah, I won't even see that. I'll be dead before you guys are doctors, before you get there. I don't expect to live that long. You know, seven, eight more years, ten. They'll just be coming out of residency. They'll just be coming out of their specialties, see? And I say that with great honesty. I, I'm not morbid about it. I, I don't expect, I don't know how I'm going to die, but I know that death is waiting for me. As I have buried so many of my friends, many of them, many of them are considerably younger than myself. Death is my companion. I swim in its sea, I use a different analogy. I just know if you, that it will eventually take me. And I don't say it with morbidity or anything else, but I have a deep awareness, but I have it with hope. I have it with hope that in death I will enter the new Jerusalem with all those I am loved and been loved by, whom I have loved and been loved by, and that it will be a communion forever and a great festa, the feast in paradise. Here's what he describes, a rich feast, feast of rich, a feast of rich food and choice wines, joicy, juicy, rich food and pure choice wines. You have to know... We had these dinners at home when I was a boy. And you understand this kind of dinner. You have to have experienced it. We'd get together at 11 in the morning. Just me and my father. My father and mother were the hosts. My Uncle Freddie was in on it. My grandmother was the, one of the cooks. Invited the entire family. And when in our high school years, we'd also invite our girlfriends, okay? So it was interesting. I mean, there's maybe 20, 25 of us for dinner. We would get there at 11. My mother couldn't boil water, but she made a great hors d'oeuvre. So they came from, she, she really couldn't cook. She didn't even want to. She was a rare Italian woman. She did not know how to cook, nor did she ever aspire to it. Leave it at that. She made a great hors d'oeuvre and a terrific whiskey sour. So everybody showed up for late breakfast, which was whiskey sours and hors d'oeuvres. Leave it to the Vitali family. And then... We would start to eat. We'd start eating at 12 or 1, and it would course after course after course. And you have to know my father and Uncle Freddie were master chefs. They were, and my grandmother probably made, it by my father's account, his mother-in-law, my mother's mother, said the best Italian food she, he had ever eaten. My father was a chef. So was Uncle Freddie. You have no idea how good that dinner was. You couldn't get that in the top restaurant. They made prime rib like there was no tomorrow. You just have to know that. And we sat and ate as a table, never an argument, 
No choir. You never got out of line. Even when you were little kids, you could not raise your voice. You could not raise your voice. You couldn't knock a glass over. You had to behave at that table. But that table had unlimited wine. I believe one year, I don't want to exaggerate that we drank over 20 bottles of, bottles of wine over the course of, I'd say, how many hours? Eight or nine hours. Of course, we were adults at that time. It was the last of it back in the mid early, I don't know what it was, mid-60s. You know, my brother was in the Army. Pete and I got back just for that. You know, it was a marvelous dinner. But you were not allowed to get drunk. You were never allowed to get out of line. You could never raise your voice. It was a table of peace, just what Isaiah is saying here, and food beyond your imagination. And then late in the afternoon, friends would come by, and they would come by for the, for the, for the, uh, the dessert and the liqueurs. And then they think you're getting hungry, so they'd bring over the leftovers and start over again. People would come, I said, 11 in the morning, leave around 8 o'clock at night. Never left the table. That's what this description, that's a festa, a feast. I've never experienced anything since the Campo. I tried to do it here years and years ago, but we have no custom for dining. We have custom for eating. That's dining. That's a feast. You come early, you stay late. You never leave the table except to wash the dishes. That's interesting. You have to see that. But that's the Isaiah prophecy. I guess I can't see that anymore in this world. I don't see it happening again that I can ever imitate my father and pull it. I've tried, but it's never worked. The culture isn't here for it. But its imagery is foretold in here about paradise. When I think of paradise, I think of a communion of the beloved, the loved and the beloved, those whom we have loved and been loved at a festa at a feast, sitting at the table, no one raising their voice, glad to be there, thrilled to be there, face to face with generations. When the kids were, our, my, when Michelle was little, that was 50 something years ago, okay? The little kids, some of the little kids, how many generations, there were five generations sitting at that table for. I don't know if Michelle was alive and I might be too premature in that, but there were little, my cousins were little. A couple of my cousins, Maggie and Tommy, were very little. Okay? You see how many? Now they're grandparents. <laughs> you see? That was almost 60 years ago. Now yeah, grandparents. See? All those generations. All those generations. Friends. Relatives. Friends together. I love that line. Friends together because it's active. And behaving in friendship and love. Mutual respect. Mutual accordance and love. That's Isaiah here, my opinion. He foretells it, I saw it. I saw it in my home. The liturgy is supposed to be that, but it isn't because it's too, it's too structured. A fasta is a dinner. It's a dinner that doesn't go away. It doesn't take a half hour. It takes nine and 10 hours. See? With multiple generations equally present from infants to the elderly, eating at the table, see, eating at the table. My father used to take the empty bottles of wine and put them under the table. You had to see it, you had to see it. Quiet, gentle, magnificent. My cousins still remember that, it was 60 years ago, still remember it. How could you forget it? In my view, it's a foretaste of paradise. It's just a foretaste but a real foretaste. That's what Christmas was for us, a festa in my father's home, my parents' home, a festa.